Okay, so so this is the chapter six overview, part two. Uh, in part one, we looked at really topics that relate to photons. Um, the, we are still in the semi-historical uh, introduction to quantum mechanics. And I think I mentioned this before, the thing that really distinguishes quantum mechanics from special relativity is that uh, there's a sense of coherence in the introduction to special relativity. Uh, we start out with the two postulates and everything is kind of logically deducible from the two postulates, which were actually pretty reasonable to start with. The first one says, uh, the first one spells out the principle of relativity, the second one, uh, the way I like to call it is the correctness of the theory of electrodynamics. And um, so with a special relativity, you had a fairly solid theoretical grounding and everything was just uh, resolving paradoxes, um, realigning your intuition based on your understanding that's based on the, um, uh, on the um, I guess, revelation of um, nature of the universe that's been uh, revealed through our theory of electricity and magnetism. So that's a special relativity. And with the quantum mechanics, you don't have that clean picture. And what we covered in the first half with the introduction of the photon idea is in fact that we are kind of going backwards. <laughs> the history of the the uh, late 18th century and early 19th century really was uh, settling the question of is light particle or wave? And we thought it got settled as being waves. Um, that was the whole development of the theory of, or um, it could be tied to the development of the theory of electrodynamics. Maxwell's equations predicts electromagnetic wave, which happens to have all the properties that match up with the light. And now we are going back. Um, with the photoelectric effect, we introduced the uh, photon idea, or what seems like a reintroduction of the corpuscular <laughs> theory of uh, light. And what I pointed out then is that um, we have to be careful to note that as we are introducing the particle nature of light, we haven't given up on any of the wave nature of light as we call light photon, we are going to, we have been referring to wavelength and frequency of photon. And it turns out um, um, those wave properties of light continues to have meaning. And, um, and this is the, uh, what, from some angle, what will be a paradoxical idea about photons that um, you can't choose one or the other, wave or particle, particle or wave. You have to, I think uh, in classical mechanics, we are conditioned into thinking of those two things as distinct, separate things. A phenomenon is either a wave, you know, wave on a string, sound wave, or it's a particle, uh, like atom is a particle. Uh, baseball is a kind of particle. And uh, we are not used to mixing those two together. And what we are hoping that you will get to do, <laughs> get to uh, develop your intuition for is to contain both ideas at the same time without one necessarily conflicting with the other. So in the first half um, is our introduction of the photon idea, which we actually have been using a little bit earlier when we were doing special relativity with the uh, special relativity dynamics and whatnot. And what we are looking at in the second half is the other side. So with the photons, what you can look at it as is, this is something that we are used to thinking of as a, something that is a wave nature, light is a wave. And we were introducing it to particle properties and how the particle property of light helps explain things like a photoelectric effect and how it's a very natural way to handle Compton effect, a high energy collision between photon and a charged particle. Now, what we are going to switch gears is and, and look at is, we're going to look at things that we are used to thinking of as particles and look at how they have wave nature. 
And this is the part of the chapter where the lecture goes uh, in a little bit different order than the text of it. Uh, in lecture, I actually start out with a De Broglie, uh, by the way, I'm always gonna mispronounce De, De Broglie or De Broglie. Um, I keep asking each of my class if anyone speaks French and I want to learn the correct pronunciation for this name. Um, depending on what I feel like, I'm either going to say De Broglie or I'm going to try to say De Broglie. And I don't know if either of them are correct pronunciations because I don't speak French. Someone please tell me what's correct. <laughs> so in the lecture, I started up with the De Broglie uh, hypothesis and then um, move on to Bohr's model. De Broglie hypothesis, it kind of connect, connects nicely with the introduction of both. Um, for the purpose of this overview, I'll just go in the order that your textbook does and highlight the things that I want you to read carefully as you are looking through the textbook and um, question yourself to make sure that you fully understood it. So uh, section 6.4 is Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. This is the first of the semi-classical models that you will look at uh, this week. Um, first and maybe the, um, the last. I think we might have more. So this section contains quite a few information. Um, some of these are things that you might already know, like you might already know the, the things like atomic nucleus exist. <laughs> so um, what this section covers is the history of the discovery of atomic nucleus. So I would uh, um, recommend that you give it a read through so that you know the things that um, educated the physicists, engineers expected to know. Uh, this is the atomic spectra, which you might already know about. This is like the fingerprint of uh, elements. Uh, different elements uh, emit different uh, specific lines, either as an emission spectra or do they show? Uh, they don't show a Gerson spectrum. But, and um, so this section of the textbook is describing again, giving a, uh, giving a historical introduction. All these are empirical discoveries that were discovered empirically through analysis of data, people didn't quite connect to this, uh, what we call quantum mechanics now. Where the, the beginning of quantum mechanics starts is um, where people are thinking of the models of the atom that starts with the Rutherford gold foil experiment, which um, gave a conclusive evidence for existence of the atomic nucleus. In, um, so people were trying to think of a ways to um, so an atom has uh, different charged particles. It has negatively charged particle, which uh, was initially called, uh, well, not beta ray, uh, cathode ray. Uh, init was initially called a cathode ray, and it was eventually identified, oh, it's a new particle. It's a subatomic particle. It's a beam of electrons. And um, so you have negatively charged the thing, but since the, uh, on, an atom as a whole is neutral, there must be a positive part. And people are trying to figure out how they are arranged. And plum pudding model is one such model that was uh, ruled out early on. And it was ruled out through the Rutherford uh, gold foil experiment. The only model that was consistent with uh, how, what he found in the experiment, which was, oh, they don't have figures. Um, well. If you want, you can look up rather for the gold foil experiment and uh, look at the experimental setup. Um, it, the the uh, significant fraction of the the alpha alpha particles, uh, rather heavy uh, radioactive, not radioactive, um, heavy product of radiation. The fact that it got a significant fraction of them got bounced straight back from gold foil gave evidence that in the structure of the atom, there must be a very dense, a very small um, uh, concentration of positive charge and most of the mass of the atom. So, um, and in that model, it, there came to be a bit of a difficulty in explaining using classical mechanics, how uh, you could have a stable arrangement of such an atom. Your textbook, um, so Rutherford model does not explain. Um, 
force model. Um, uh, so this is the key part uh, that I want you to have a good understanding of what it's talking about. Uh, classically, so this is the model of uh, an atom where people are positing, okay, you have a dense nucleus and electron to have it be attracted to the nucleus, but still in a stable arrangement. You kind of uh, thinking classically, you have to make it go around in an orbit. So as you make it go around in the orbit, this is uh, this sentence is describing the, the, the consequence of such a model. The electron is a charged particle, and as it's moving around the nucleus in a planetary fashion, as it moves in a circle, if it's not moving in a circle, it's undergoing centripetal acceleration. And that, um, so this is, begins to look like an oscillating dipole. And whenever you have an accelerating charged particle, it emits electromagnetic radiation. Um, you're going to see other examples of electromagnetic radiation being emitted by accelerating charged particles. Um, there's something called the Bram's trial that you will see when we do particle physics. Um, so, so in that motion of the electron, if it's emitting electromagnetic radiation, then it must be losing energy. So it should be, um, so it should be spiraling into the nucleus, and that's the classical prediction that's similar to the UV catastrophe. It's a very catastrophic prediction that doesn't actually happen. So Bohr's model is the model that's uh, designed to avoid that catastrophe. Um, catastrophe of a theoretical failure, really. And Bohr introduces this idea that when, as the electron orbits, it must uh, satisfy this condition. And it's a condition that says that this uh, L, it's referring to the orbital angular momentum of the electron, that this orbital angular momentum of electron, which classically can take any value. It depends on the momentum of the electron and how far away is it. The R cross P gives you the angular momentum. And um, depending on how fast it's moving, what distance is it, classically it takes any continuous set of values. But Bohr, um, for no particular, with no particular justification, he assumed, what if this value of angular momentum is quantized? It doesn't take just any continuous set of values, but it can only take an um, integer unit of this quantized value, h bar or reduce the Planck constant, that's uh, uh, h divided by 2 pi. It, quite common. So um, instead of writing two pi every single time, we just have bar to indicate that we are dividing H Planck's constant by two pi. So he just assumed this, uh, that angular momentum of the electron can only take these allowed values. And if someone were to ask why, at this point in the development of quantum mechanics, there's no good answer. The answer to why is, hey, it gives the right answer. So the rest of the textbook goes to describe how starting out with this assumption, uh, Bohr can actually, you can actually redrive the Rydberg formula that was way up at the top. You go through, you go through what is essentially classical art, uh, analysis of the electron orbit. And as you go through this classical analysis of electron orbit, at some point you, impose a condition that, um, uh, so this is the uh, where they impose the condition. There's a relationship between the allowed velocity and allowed radius. It's connected by this. And, um, and you can have a lot of radii of the, the, the electrons orbit and plug that into the formula uh, for the, the total energy potential and kinetic energy. And you come up with this derivation, so plugging the formula for kinetic and potential energy, you come up with this expression. And when you plug in all these constants, you get this. And you end up redriving this key feature of the Rydberg formula, which is that allowed energies, the energies between discrete levels of the atom, go as one over n squared uh, of the hydrogen atom for other atoms gets more complicated. 
So for hydrogen or hydrogen-like color, it goes at one over n squared. So I would recommend uh, following through this argument of Bohr's semi-classical analysis. It's good exercise, good review of the classical mechanics that you should know. Um, there's also lecture. <laughs> um, and in the end, the kind of, this is the form I like to express it because all this complicated expression for inert, uh, it's great if you can drive it. <laughs> in the end, for a hydrogen atom, it becomes a rather simple value of 13.6 electron volts. And, um, and with this one over n squared dependence, this uh, uh, reproduces uh, the, Rydberg, uh, the Rydberg formula. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, spe spectral emission lines of a hydrogen. Um, and yeah, this is the <laughs> Rydberg formula. So again, this is the historical introduction to um, quantum mechanics. And um, I point you back to this, uh, uh, quantum mechanical assumption, Bohr's assumption that um, that angular momentum is quantized, and <laughs> and this is what sometimes makes the quantum mechanics challenging, which is that there are places where you enter an assumption that 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 is poorly motivated, in the sense that we don't have a good answer to why, we only have the justification that, hey, this uh, <laughs> leads to the correct result. <laughs> um, so the next section of the textbook attempts to give a little bit of a justification for this. You could justify this in terms of a um, broader assumption that a French physicist named Louis de Broglie made. Um, he, I, I like to think of it as a him taking Einstein's idea that uh, there's a relationship between energy of a photon and its frequency and extending it to things beyond the photon. And, um, and when you try to do that, uh, so I go through that in the lecture, <laughs> um, you can write energy in terms of momentum for a relativistic particle like a photon. And you can come up with an expression that is independent of speed of light, which you might suspect only applies to light and um, independent of mass of the particle, um, at least not directly dependent on the mass of the particle, because I'm hoping, we are hoping to get an expression that's applicable to not just the light or massless particle, but to every kind of particle, including the ones that are half mass. And this relationship is the relationship that you arrive at. Um, that's equivalent to, th to this for photon and for things other than photon, it's not exactly clear that they are equivalent. And this is the de Broglie hypothesis, that this is, uh, this expression is something that applies to everything in the universe. This connects the two sides of um, uh, something, like a particle like an electron that has particle nature, like momentum of an electron. That's a particle description of the electron. And to its uh, wave nature, wavelength of electron. Uh, up until this point, it kind of made no sense to talk about wavelength of electron because you know what we're talking about, it's a particle. It might have a physical dimension, but that's not the same thing as wavelength. And um, this De Broglie relationship is what connects that wave side of the something <laughs> wavelength to the particle properties of that something, its momentum. And uh, you can also use this to kind of justify um, justify the the uh, Bohr's uh, hypothesis or guess about the electrons in orbit. Um, you could say, oh, um, so the Bohr's um, quantization condition that angular momentum is um, quantized, you could derive it if you assume that, um, so electron in a hydrogen particle atom behaves like a wave and the condition is that it should be in a standing wave. Um, and I, I will just caution you that uh, it's not really a derivation. It's uh, just showing consistency between 
two different crazy quantum mechanical ideas. Uh, sometimes um, what we physicists try to shoot for, it's not necessarily um, watertight derivation, that's for mathematicians, but rather self-consistency. Uh, self-consistency at least means that our theory is not crazy, or it might be crazy, but it's not so crazy that it's probably fa false. So um, this connection between the De Broglie hypothesis and Bohr's uh, quantization condition is showing, hey, maybe there's something here that um, the angular moment of quantization condition, it's consistent with the thinking of electron as going around the nucleus in a fashion similar to a standing wave. And, and I'm giving you this caution because um, this picture doesn't turn out to be quite right. When we do the fully quantum mechanical treatment, I think in two weeks, um, you'll see that this picture of electron in orbit is not right at all. If you've taken chemistry class, you ha might have seen electron cloud. And as far as representation score, that is the correct representation. But um, this is uh, at least the beginning place of uh, our introduction to quantum mechanics and some of the strange assumptions that go into quantum mechanics. Um, I go through this more in the lecture, um, particularly taking care to separate out what I call quantum mechanical assumptions that will turn out to hold exactly even at the full, um, not just the early, but fully developed quantum mechanical theories. The quantization of orbital angular momentum is one of them, um, just not in the exact way that Bohr imagined. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, uh, oh, there's a, this experiment, I don't think we really covered it in lecture. I encourage you to read it through it. This actually connects to uh, one of the, interference diffraction condition in early, uh, in chapter four that I kind of skipped out on. So uh, if you do read about this, make sure that you go back and look at, um, I think it's under X-ray diffraction. So um, there's a, something called the Brock scattering that I decided not to cover. <laughs> but the kind of the interference arrangement that they are setting up in this experiment is this a Brock scattering arrangement? Just to read the um, electrons, not uh, not light. So, so read it through that. But I don't think I'm asking you any questions on that because not any quantitative questions. Um, so that's a chapter. Uh, sorry, section six point five. And in terms of our homework assignments, that where we kind of end that. And I would uh, encourage you to uh, read the section point section six point six. This is uh, something that we'll touch back on again it, next week as we introduce the um, uh, it, as we introduce the full wave mechanics, uh, the fully quantum mechanical treatment of certain things, and. This is a good bridge in terms of starting to think about something that we call wave particle duality, uh, what I was referring to as um, things that we were used to thinking of as waves, like light. Um, we are going to start to and continue to refer to its particle property, the energy of a photon, the particle of light. And things that you are used to thinking of as particles, like particle. Um, next to it, you are, I'm going to talk about particle in a box. And it's a particle. It has mass. It has momentum. It has uh, all the things you expect of a particle. And plus, it has um, wavelength. And the fact that this thing has wavelength is important in determining what kind of allowed energies that this localized particle is allowed to have. In classical mechanics, it would have been allowed to have any energy. It could have had the zero energy. It could have any continuous amount of um, positive kinetic energy. And in quantum mechanics, it, uh, it gets quantized. Energy gets quantized. So this is a kind of that bridge, um, getting you to start thinking about, uh, I guess, the wave and particle nature of things as not being exclusive. 
And I think this particular thing that they're discussing here, I bring that uh, later on. I think I was looking for this at the end of the last virtual class session, and I'll bring that back uh, when it's uh, more appropriate. <laughs> and this, in fact, is the uncertainty principle, which gets properly covered in section uh, 7.2. Um, they're mentioning it here early for whatever reason. <laughs> and uh, if we have time today, uh, I'll talk about how uh, there's a way to think of this uh, uh, position momentum uncertainty principle in terms of something that you can actually get at classically. Uh, this doesn't have to be anything that's mysterious. Once you accept the uh, De Broglie's idea that momentum relates to wavelength of quantum mechanical things, then uh, there's a really beautiful classical way to get at this. Um, um, we'll either talk about it today at the end, or uh, we'll bring that back uh, next week when we talk about uncertainty principle. So that's a longish second over, overview of the second half of chapter six. And um, the remaining time today, I'll use that for a lecture that I've been wanting to do for a while. So any questions on chapter six? Um, so the way we are covering chapter six, you know, it's, uh, um, it's a bit different from how we are used to covering things in physics. I, I say this a lot, um, you know, physicists make a terrible historians. It's because most of the time we ignore history. <laughs> um, when we teach classical mechanics, uh, we teach as little of the history as we need to. Um, and even when we do special relativity, I think we kind of stay away from historical things. It's when we cover quantum mechanics, we want to pay more attention to history, partly because um, it's, uh, it's complicated history. And I think it's trying to stay away from that <laughs> causes more confusion than that. So uh, the chapter six is kind of historical introduction to quantum mechanics and some of the key ideas that will be important in the uh, even as we go into the fully quantum mechanical models. Um, 